Welcome back to another episode of the Black Menace Podcast. I'm your host, Rachel Weaver, and I'm here with my other host. Nate Bird. Happy to be on the show as always. Yes. Um, and today we're super excited because we have a wonderful guest with us, Terrell. Go ahead and say hi to the people real hi. quick. <laughs> yes. Um, this is going to be a really special episode um, and we're super excited. But as always, before we get into that, we will throw it back over to Nate for the Menace moment. Yes. So um, in light of our amazing guests this week, I thought I would do something that's like a combination of uh, Black and Indigenous history. So I want to talk about the Black Seminoles. Have y'all ever heard of the Black Seminoles before? Never. Actually, no. Okay, this would be cool. So <clears throat> I, I, it was a lot of information to try and condense into like something short, but let's see if I can do it. So the Black Seminoles or the Afro Seminoles are Native, Afri or are Native American Africans associated with the Seminole people in Florida and Oklahoma. They are mostly blood descendants of the Seminole people, free Africans, and escaped former slaves who allied with Seminole groups in Spanish Florida. Uh, so before the United States owned Florida or took it from the Spanish or wanted whatever you want to call it, um, it was owned by the Spanish, and their, part of their strategy for defending their claim of Florida um, was based on folk forcing the local Native American tribes into a mission system. Um, so they like would put them in the missions, um, which are basically like I guess like forts. Like the Alamo was a mission, right, or something like that. I don't know. I don't really know how that works. Anyway, they would like put them in these forts um, and basically like force them to serve as a militia to protect um, the the colony of Florida from invasions by from like you know the people of South Carolina and like other. Um, colonies, right? So, due to a combination of raids by South Carolinian, South Carolinian yeah, colonists, yeah, that sounds right. Yeah, <laughs> and newly introduced. Okay, so it's a combination of raids from people in South Carolina and uh, newly introduced European diseases, to which Native Americans had no immunity. Um, they were quickly, you know, almost almost wiped out because of the diseases and because of these colonial raids. Um, so after the local indigenous peoples had all but died out, Spanish authorities encouraged Native Americans and runaway slaves from the southern colonies to move to their territory. So kind of like, you know, a lot of slaves went to, um, you know, Canada. You always hear about like Canada being the land of freedom. The Spanish were also encouraging slaves to come to, to Florida and be, quote unquote, free. Um, so it had been a refuge for fugitive slaves for at least 70 years by the time of the American Revolution. Communities of Black Seminoles were established on the outskirts of major Seminole towns. And so there was kind of like um, as the the runaway slaves would come to Florida, um, they would kind of sort of intermingle with like the Native American tribes. And they had like a little bit of their own culture, but then also there was like intermarriage and like um, cooperation between the two different groups. Um, and so they kind of formed a new group called the, the Black Seminoles or they called them Maroons, which... It's kind of problematic, but, you know, different times. Um, so let's see. During the revolution, the Seminole and uh, the Seminole allied with the British and the African-Americans and Seminoles came into increased contact with each other. The Seminole held some slaves, as did the Creek and other Southeast Native American tribes. Um, during the War of 1812, members of both communities sided with the British against the U.S. in hopes of repelling American settlers. They strengthened their internal ties and earned uh, the enmity of American General Andrew Jackson. Um, in, in exchange for paying an annual tribute of livestock crops, hunting, and war party obligations, black prisoners or fugitives uh, were able to find sanctuary among the Seminole. And um, in turn, the Seminoles acquired uh, a strategic ally in a sparsely populated region. Um, so they elected their own leaders. They could like build up wealth and crops and, and uh, you know herds of cattle, things like that. And they're also able to defend themselves. Um, and in Florida real estate records will currently show that Seminole and Black Seminole people owned a lot of land in Florida, um, which was later stolen from them by, by the government. Um, and in some cases, uh, a lot of that land is actually still owned by Seminole and Black Seminole descendants. Um, <clears throat> after the War of 1812, Andrew Jackson attacked something called the Negro Fort, which had become like a Black Seminole stronghold um, uh, when the British allowed to allowed Black people to occupy it. Um, so he he tried to break that up, and it was kind of like one of his major objectives in what's called the Seminole War, which is not really a war that uh, America likes to talk about, mm, but they call it the Seminole yeah, War because it like it. went down into Florida and attacked mm. the Seminole and Black Seminole people. Um, and so, you know, not long after that, in the 1830s, uh, more than 500 Black Seminoles traveled with uh, the Seminoles thousands of miles to uh, pre what is present-day Oklahoma, um, to some of the you know the new territories that they were located to or relocated to. Um, and you know, part of that was known as the the Trail of Tears. So, you know, Black Seminoles were a part of that. Um, and then, kind of after moving 
And, you know, in the 1800s, there was kind of like a, a unique black Seminole culture that that took place, which was like a combination of like West African tradition, black American tradition, and then Native American tradition. Mm. So they would wear like traditional Seminole clothing and they would eat similar food. Um, like they gathered roots of a native plant called kunti and they would like grind it, soak it, and make um, like a flour that was similar to arrowroot. They would also mash up corn with mortar and pestle to make sofki, which is like a, a type of porridge you mix with water. Um, and then their language was a mix of African, Seminole, and Spanish words. Wow. So kind of cool, right? Like a really interesting combination. Um, and then a lot of their their heritage is um, like thoughts from, thought by academics to be uh, from the Congo and Yoruba peoples and like some other African oh, okay. groups. So it's kind of all tied in. Um, yeah, they did. They developed their own unique African American culture, kind of mixed with the Seminole culture, where they had like a like a looser form of Christianity, kind of coming from like being on plantations and being slaves and things mm. like that. Um, certain practices, like jumping the broom, were still celebrated. Mm. Um, and then they also had like different African names for some of the towns that they were in. Um, and as time progressed, let's see, we can skip over that. Um, but yeah, so even today. Uh, just to kind of wrap it up, there's kind of a, a little bit of controversy surrounding Black Seminoles because they're actually discriminated against um, uh, in within the Native American Indigenous community. Um, they're mm. not fully recognized as members of the Indigenous community because mm. of their dark skin and their like kinky hair. Um, and so there's been some controversy about that and like efforts to try and become fully recognized under that. And so that's like a battle that's still going on. Um, with trying to become fully recognized and also trying to reclaim some of the land that was taken from mm. them um, when they were forced out of Florida in the 1800s. Mm. Uh, and so, yeah, there's a lot of information here. I didn't put it together as well as I wanted to, but That's in okay. a nutshell, that is the Black Seminoles. So It's cool. Yeah, I, something that I learned about not too long ago yeah. and it's been very fascinating. So Yeah, I never heard about them. So That's Thank you for really that. Yeah. <laughs> for sure, for sure. Um, I always love learning about different cultures and it's always interesting to me to see just because of the transatlantic slave trade how many cultures like people with african ancestry are involved in or end up like having roots in it's yeah. very like the older i get the more i see like there's more and more cultures where there is some type of connection to african ancestry because of the transatlantic slave trade mm -hmm. and then being moved all across the globe because of it and um seeing just like the parts of how like it's influenced somewhere or like there's a subset of that culture um, as well. So it's, it's always interesting to me. Absolutely. Mm. Well, with that, we're going to jump into our interview. Yes. So excited to interview Terrell. We've been talking about this for weeks. I've been super excited. Like, if you talk to any of the Black ministers, I've been telling everybody, oh, we're going to talk to Terrell. He's yeah. just Native American. Yes. He's so excited. <laughs> but Terrell, do you kind of just want to introduce yourself? Um, yeah. Just give us like a brief bio. You know, Absolutely. Talk about it, so. Yeah. So um, like they said, you know, uh, my name is Terrell Benali. Um, I go by Terrell Two Spirit on social media. Um just, you know, trying to get the two spirit, you know, across mm -hmm. because, you know, not a lot of people um, know or have much knowledge about two spirit people, mm -hmm. even, um, you know, indigenous people within our own communities mm -hmm. don't even um, not only know about them, but some of them uh, do not recognize them anymore. And, that, you know, it's not really necessarily their fault either, because a lot has to do with the whole um, um you know, going through the boarding schools and kind of that whole process that happened. And that itself is a whole nother topic. Um, but yeah, uh, if I could, I'd like to introduce myself in my Dene language. It's yeah. how we um, introduce ourselves whenever we, Please. you know, are um, off our homelands yeah. just to, you know. So yeah, this is going to be my introduction in Navajo slash Dene. Mm -hmm. um, so Yat Esh a Terrell Banali Yinishia Desh Chini Nishla Tabaha Bashis Chini Tachini Deshache. And uh the last fourth clan that I am still trying to um familiarize myself with because I just recently reconnected with my father. Um so I'm still trying to get that fourth clan that directly correlates with your father's side. Um because uh so what i just you know said in that language um was you know my name and who i am and my four clans well my three clans but uh how that works is we have a clan system within our culture mm. and um 
and that just makes up, you know, who you are, where you come from, uh, because, um, you know, in our uh, in our culture, ke is everything, which is, you know, kinship. Mm. And so we're very, oh, sorry, <laughs> we're very um, strong believers on that. So um, wherever you go, you know, when you introduce yourself, like if you uh, reconnect with a fellow, you know, native out there, Navajo, Diné, um, there's an on running joke, you know, saying that there's a Navajo just about everywhere, which I have come to find true, no matter where I travel, <laughs> there's usually like one Navajo somewhere. <laughs> so yeah, um, and that just kind of tells you um, with those four clans just kind of tells you who you are. And if you're related to another um person that you're meeting yeah. because okay. it is very important those especially the first two clans those two clans are very important my two clans are desh chitney and uh Tobaha, sorry um and those two clans kind of tell you who your brothers and sisters are mm -hmm. and you know other family members within the rest of the four clans but those two first clans are very crucial because you it is kind of like taboo to uh, date or have relations with someone who has those, you know, same two clans, mm. even if they just have one of the, um, <clears throat> one of the clans, mm. it's usually like a no, no. Okay, so, right. so it's kind of yeah. like, don't date your cousin. Kind exactly. Of yeah, okay. Because that's another problematic thing <laughs> is, um, I'm not even just going to say Navajos. Uh, a lot of natives like to date their cousins or it, it's, it's not like, you know, they like to, it's just that they find themselves, um, doing that by mistake just because mm. they didn't introduce themselves with that clan mm. um so yeah it's very important and i'm like that's the first thing we got to do is you know exchange clans through, not only for that but also you know to know who you are and where you come from and yeah. all of that so yeah that was just my little introduction yeah. sorry i was going on a little tangent no <laughs> that was perfect i'm learning a lot yeah yes. i just don't know much about um, that so. I feel like we both have so many questions. Mm -hmm. Nate, do you want to go first with your question? Or? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, um, part of the reason that I initially reached out to you is I think you had maybe, like, or you had sent us a message a while back. Yeah, it's almost been a year now. Yeah, actually. yeah. Uh, yeah. When you first reached yeah. out to us. I, reached, I think it was, like, in October of last mm -hmm. year because okay. I wanted to do um, a video for Native American History Month, which mm -hmm. is in November. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm going to be in town and whatever, you know, because I really, I was obsessed with the video styles that y'all do. <laughs> and I, like I said, I've been a fan for a very long time. So Thank I just you. thought it would have been a perfect opportunity. But that didn't even work out either just because I also, that's when I started, um, you know, uh, getting my brand together mm -hmm. in, yeah. So, okay. But yes. Yeah. So I remember like, so you reached out a while back and then, yeah, the thing we were going to do didn't end up working out, mm -hmm. but then I was going through old messages and I saw that and I was like, oh, wow, this, he would be amazing to interview on the podcast. And so we reached back out and then it's been well, probably like a month and a half of coordinating. Yeah. 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 Trying time. to get, yeah. But schedules um, to line up. I was like, man, I'd love to have Terrell on the, uh, on the podcast. And one of the biggest reasons for that is because of your your Instagram name, which is Terrell Two Spirit. Mm -hmm. And I know very very little about Two Spirit Native Americans. Same. But I think that like in today's climate, where um, people are learning to be more tolerant of of genders and orientations and nationalities and ethnicities and all that stuff, I think that it's super important to have um, but places for people to educate themselves. And that's like something that we're very passionate about with Black Menaces. So if you could just kind of explain to us a little bit about what it means to be a two spirit yeah um, like where the kind of like the history of where that comes from okay and like how that's what that's meant to you in your life absolutely so um um like i said you know um i identify as two spirit so it is a very crucial that it's a it's a part of my name just because i want that to be pretty straightforward like mm. you know um and it, it's caught a lot of attention um both you know negative and positive mm. uh, it's kind of that it's a double-ended sword, really. And um, the term two-spirit actually didn't come up until the 90s. Um, oh, it, but okay. that doesn't mean, you know, it's necessarily a new term because um, in our cultures, you know, two-spirit people have been around for centuries mm -hmm. um, since basically the beginning of time. And, um, uh, and it is very nation-to-nation -nation specific, meaning, you know, it depends on what tribe you are and what mm -hmm. tribe you come from. And it just varies on... Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, uh, so I'm Dene slash Navajo. Um, our definition and, you know, symbol and symbolic um, 
symbolism. I'm so sorry. I'm blanking. You're good. Our um our definition and you know symbolism of two spirit people can be completely different from like other tribes. Mm. Um and we even have, you know, names uh like I said, two spirit didn't the word two spirit didn't come up until the 90s. And that was kind of serving as a um a bridge you know like it's it's an umbrella term really but it's there to bridge the uh us indigenous people with um you know western uh knowledge of gender and sexuality mm. um just to better understand and come to like a common ground to where it's you know you understand us better uh because how do i say this um so like i said i'm Danae. so um how we uh said or I, you know, in our language, two spirit is not glen. Um, sorry, let me retake that. <laughs> um, in our in our uh, Dene culture, you know how we say two spirit is not glen, and that just means that translates to one who transforms. So you know, if I need to be feminine one day or masculine one day, I can transform and be that uh, mm-hmm. spirit that I need to be, uh, just depending on the task and what. Uh, situation is at hand um and say you know like lakotas uh that's a different tribe and they their word for two spirit is wink day so yeah and like i said it's very uh complex but yet simple at the same time just because like it, the simplicity comes from the um umbrella term two mm. spirit and like i said that's just there to serve as a bridge uh for basically you know european western uh knowledge to better understand us and our sexuality and gender roles <clears throat> because um and i should have said this earlier um i speak for myself and how i was uh, brought up on my teachings and culture um i do not speak for all natives or nor you know indigenous people and i especially don't speak for all navajos but <laughs> mm. i'm just that's a little disclaimer because you know mm. when we see mm. meet other natives it, um it becomes a little problematic when like um they say yeah you were taught this by a Dene uh individual but in our culture it could mean the complete opposite mm. uh you know like taboo things you know even stuff like um uh like the like the clan system uh, you know um if you could just tell us like a little bit about uh the history of or you talked a little bit about like how the, the word two spirit kind of came about in the 90s oh yeah okay um, so so the word itself yes two spirit did yeah. come in uh ni- the 90s so it is relatively a new term but like i said you know it, uh, us two spirit people have been in our uh communities and cultures for centuries mm-hmm. and we've preserved this way of life for so long um and what i was going to say what i was going to say is you know uh, like i said before um not all nations and not all tribes do recognize two spirit people unfortunately mm-hmm. and um as i said before that's not really you know a lot a lot of the blame doesn't have to go back onto them just because um uh the trauma and um the trauma that you know ripping our people off our lands and putting them through the boarding school system kind of I don't want to necessarily say brainwash but you know strip them of their you know land culture and teachings and way of life essentially so a lot of them that you know grew up through that system um kind of forgot that way of life and now you know when they were you know and those who did survive boarding school uh taught that you know kind of to their future generations to not recognize two spirit people and that's what i mean when i say you know not all the blame is to be on our own people but yes um where it does exist and where it is celebrated um like Dene people lakota and other tribes who do celebrate two spirit people um and recognize us thankfully um know that you know historically we have always been sacred and held in high regard uh we even held uh you know prestigious positions such as um medicine men and um in our, in my culture specifically we have a left side and a right side and one side is feminine and one side is masculine mm. and you usually possess one or the other but two spirit people you know get to 
possess both. And like I said before, you know, if I need to be more feminine one day or, you know, masculine the next day, it just really determines or it just really depends on the situation at hand. Um, I can do that and kind of transform between both. Um, <clears throat> and hold on, I'm, I'm blanking right now. <laughs> you're good, you're good. So if, if you could put it into like Western terms, I guess, um, what would be the, like the best way to describe it? Is it like gender fluidity, gender non-binary? So, yeah, like I said before, it is, um, it's an umbrella term, so mm -hmm. it can be all of those. Oh, okay. It's, it's gotcha, non-exclusive gotcha. to sexuality. It's not exclusive to gender roles. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So it's, it's, it's an umbrella term and I hate to be that, um, you know, general about it, but that's basically what it is. That makes sense. Um, okay. So is it kind of similar? I'm just trying to like figure out the best way for like people who maybe have never yeah, heard this yeah, before. Yeah. Is it similar to using the word queer? Like if uh, like a gay person or a lesbian person or asexual person says I'm queer, is it kind of like similar to that within uh, within Navajo culture or Diné culture, or is it like a little bit more complex than? It is way more complex. Way more, okay, it is gotcha, way more gotcha. complex. Because yes. it's not just sexuality. Yeah, it's not, it's not just, just like sexuality. Who I'm attracted it's, to or like what I yeah, exactly. Like it's like it includes. Again, what you're talking about, like gender roles, gender the way roles, you want to express your femininity mm -hmm, and spirituality, and... all of that. Yeah. So it is so complex that, you know, that is why the word two spirit had to be created just mm -hmm. to kind of mm -hmm. give them a better under. And when I say them, I do mean, you know, like uh, Western Europeans, uh, a better idea of who we are. Um, because, um, Sorry, I'm blanking. Um, and, uh, you know, in our culture, you know, weavers tend to be uh, more female. And, uh, you know, medicine men, like I said, you know, were typically men. So um, often back then, you know, uh, if you were two-spirit, you got to do both roles. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Cool. Sorry, I'm kind of blanking. No, you're okay. <laughs> I'm I'm really curious on what yeah. the what your experience was like, right? Um, coming to identify as two spirit, or really what that. I know that you said it's different in every you know clan and um group and, and tribe you're a part of. So, what is that like, you know, for you specifically, and also just like overall as someone who, you know, comes to identify as two spirit? How is that you know accepted in your um clan? Is uh -huh. it is it hard? Do you feel like you're encouraged? Like, I'm just really curious. Yeah, what that is like just Because my mm -hmm. only experience is just someone who, you know, in Western culture comes to identify as gay, lesbian, you know, queer or being um, non-binary. Like that is, you know, a difficult process yeah. in Western culture and black culture. Yeah. I've seen it amongst my friends. And so I'm just curious what that was like for you yeah. and, and other people that you might know that are also two-spirit. Exactly. Um, like I said, um, when I did change my username, there was a lot of, um, not necessarily backlash, but there, you know, there was some bad and there's some good, obviously. Uh, but in terms of, you know, coming to identify with being two spirit, um, it really came naturally to me, you know, just as, uh, natural as the sun comes out every day. It's just kind of who I am because I, once I found out, you know, um, the definition of two spirit and what that really meant in my culture specifically, that is when I had, you know, so many questions from my grandparents and I was just like, you know, did you always know about, you know, two spirit people? And if so, you know, why was I not informed about it? And, um, what it came down to was them saying, you know, they just wanted to protect me just because, mm -hmm. you know, the world, um, especially in a, you know, colonized world it is uh mm. very hard to um be who you are and uh come to how would you say um especially you know from our cultures uh specifically you know um indigenous and black people have been you know one of the most suppressed and stripped of their you know who they are essentially mm. and so they, I did, like I said, you know, I grew up on the Navajo reservation mm. and here in Utah, I, right? Yes. Here in Utah, yeah. this is a very, very small part of the land and, uh, part partially in Arizona because I live like right on the border. Oh yeah. So yeah. Um, I went to, I kind of went in between both because my grandparent, my grandfather lives in, um, in the Arizona side of the border and my grandmother lives on the Utah side of the border. So I got to spend mm. a lot of uh, my mm. life in, in both places. Um, 
what was I going to say? You're talking about growing up on the Navajo reservation. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. So yes. Um, and back then, or even to this day, you know, a lot of elders, like I said, do not recognize two spirit people. So it is very, uh, dangerous, I guess, you know, to come out as two spirit. And that is why, you know, one of my biggest, um, plans for the future is to, you know, create a, um, LGBT, uh, two spirit community center mm -hmm. or resource center of that nature, just, you know, for two spirits and queer youth to come, um, and celebrate who they are, you know, and mm -hmm. basically have a facility of where, you know, you feel safe and love because a lot of the, um, I get so many messages every single day from, mm -hmm. uh, Dene, Navajo, uh, youth, and, you know, other tribes, even, you know, from Canada that are just like, you know, I'm scared to come out, you know, mm -hmm. and I don't even know if I'm gay or bi or if I'm two-spirit. How did you know? And, you know, so many questions. And it's, it, 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 heart, it breaks my heart because, you know, a lot of them are so, so young. And um, I just, and majority of them are scared to be, you know, stripped of that shelter and ultimately place of love. So that is why I want to create one of the, you know, first, you know, LGBTQ two spirit plus, um, resource center. And that'll act as both, you know, um, a place of love and kindness and also, a, you know, like I said, resource, whether that's shelter, food, and, coming to terms with who you are because we don't have, you know, anything like that. We don't even have, you know, shelter specifically for like queer youth, which is also very dangerous. So, mm. um, yeah. And like I said, yes, I did grow up on the Navajo reservation. And like I said, I got to basically be Hannah Montana and, you know, live the best of both worlds in Arizona <laughs> and Utah. <laughs> and, um, uh, I did spend a lot of my life in Utah, but, you know, for my, t uh, for my, younger years, I did spend a lot of that in Arizona, which was my grandfather's side. And the difference between um, his place and my grandma's place is, is was just huge. Um, at the time, both were without um, water or electricity. Mm -hmm. And so about, you know, a huge part of my childhood, I had to, you know, um, basically adapt to that. Because mm -hmm. um, I was taken away from my mother at a very young age because she wasn't fit to uh, care for me. Mm -hmm. uh, she had me when she was only 15 years old. Mm -hmm. So um, I grew up with my grandparents. And um, like I said, you know, no running water, no electricity. Um, it, was, it, it was really hard to even... Um, do basic things in life, you know, we take so many things for granted, mm -hmm. like, you know, Absolutely. showers and cooking on a stove and heat, central, central cooling. Oh yeah. my gosh. Yes. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Especially and that, in Utah and Arizona, like on that border. Like, exactly. Okay. Uh -huh. So hot. Yeah. I drove down there last summer and I was like, it's time for me to go. Oh, yeah. <laughs> She's like, I'm clocking out. Mm -hmm. I <laughs> yeah. lived in Phoenix for a year and that was the only place I ever got a sunburn. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. Phoenix is major. So I can't. To not uh, have AC, I can't even. Mm -hmm. wow. Yeah, exactly. And like I said, it was a huge part of my childhood. And, you know, to this day, there are still so many um, houses and communities that are still without water and electricity. Mm. And it's an ongoing battle, you know, with the government. And of course, you know, that's another. Um, which story is, for another day yeah. but yeah such a, such a massive injustice it just fills me with anger yes it's, it's really gross you know like, how can you okay putting people in situations like that yeah and it's not even it wasn't even our choice you know to be put on that you know part of the mm, land they, yeah. it was just kind of like you know there's no more oil and stuff here to take so you know you, i guess you guys can have it back <clears throat> mm. so it was very that um and so, yeah, like I said, uh, a lot of the times basically growing up, uh, getting ready for school, what that looked like was uh, the weekends, we would uh, take our, you know, our truck to the nearest, um, the nearest well or the nearest, uh, yeah, the nearest well where we would pump our own water out of the ground. And we'd fill up this huge tank that fits the whole bed of the truck and that usually lasted like a good three to four days mm -hmm. um for and you know we use that water for everything it was for cooking it mm -hmm. was for bathing it was for consuming um drinking 
And, you know, a lot of us um, did that for, you know, centuries. And a lot of us did that for years and years. And it kind of came with a consequence because a lot of them did get sick by that. Mm. Um, thankfully, I only had to do it for, you know, my childhood, but still, um, you know, uh, there was no such things as hot showers unless you, you know, you put a pot of hot water, I mean, a pot of water on top of the fire stove and let it sit there mm. for like a good hour. So you'd have to wake up at the crack of dawn mm. <laughs> to get a quite a, a lukewarm shower mm. and it's not even a shower i should even say that because you know you have to be outside and take cups and just right. pour it on yourself yeah it was very that um like i said no central heating or cooling wood stoves was everything mm -hmm. um, this is what well, this is like 2000s right yeah 2000s yeah. exactly wow yeah it's, it's crazy because it's not even that long ago yeah. um and, you know, we'd have to go haul our own firewood. Thankfully, we lived, uh, my grandparents, uh, my grandfather's side, he, his house is literally in the mountains. So, mm. like, finding wood in, uh, how you say wood in Navajo is chij. But, yeah, we would haul chij and... Yeah, and you know, you do that all year round to prepare for the winter because once mm. winter comes, all that wood is wet and mm. uh, snow covered and yeah. that's not going to do you any good. Right. Um, so, yeah. And like I said, there's some communities and some houses that are still doing that to this day just because they are without those resources. Mm. And like I said, it's just things you take for granted, really. And I didn't... You know, I saw that as a luxury when I was in my teenage years. I was mm. like, oh, my gosh, I get to take showers like every day. Are you kidding yeah. me? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Honestly, it was it's insane. <sighs> so at what point during your childhood would you say that you realized that you were different than like maybe the Ooh. average Navajo or Diné kid? Like, what, yeah. when did you? Because you probably wouldn't have known like a name for what you felt but when did you kind of know that something was different exactly exactly and being two spirit you know you kind of always have that feeling that something's off um and it's something that can only be felt by you and internally um it kind of feels like you know well one day i want to you know i want to wear makeup and you know i want to wear a dress i want to you know feel pretty and then there's and there are other times where you're just like you know i have to prove my masculinity i gotta prove my worth and i want to be like my che which translates to grandfather i want to be like my che i want to be like my dad and you know just stuff like that and from a very young age i knew uh what was being taught around me which were traditional ways um you know be a man um be strong provide for your family haul wood uh learn the ways of becoming a medicine man or a road man, which are exclusively usually for men. Mm. And that just really didn't interest me. And I come from a family of uh, artists and healers. My mm. great grandfather was a road man and medicine man, meaning, you know, he traveled um, across the country ho uh, hosting peyote meetings and ceremonies like that uh, for other people that mm. needed help. And he healed so many people. Um, his name was Jimmy Holly Sr., and I carry that name with me with such pride just because there are so many people out there who know him. Um, a lot of people call him Res Famous. It's really funny. So like <laughs> Reservation Famous. Um, <laughs> and then my grandparents, like I said, they were artists as well. Um, my grandma and my great grandmother were weavers. Uh, like I told you, like I said, um, you know, that was exclusively for women. And that is what really interested me. Um, I'll come back to that. Um, and my grandfather, he wasn't, you know, he wasn't a medicine man, but he did, you know, sing ceremonial songs while he was uh, creating pottery. So he was a pottery uh, maker. Uh, he had his own kiln. He would, you know, be up all nights of the hours. It was, it was very interesting because I took interest in weaving and also my grandfather's pottery designing. Mm. So just, you know, the beautiful shapes and colors that, you know, could be in both a rug and a pottery was just so interesting to me at a very young age. And meanwhile, you know, I'm being taught in school to, you know, do the opposite, move off the reservation, uh, go get an education at college and become a doctor, you know, get off. A lot of um, 
it's a harmful way of thinking, but it's it's taught at a very young age and it's still kind of pushed today is that, you know, you're only going to be successful if you move off your reservation. Mm. And which, you know, can be true in some cases because, you know, you need to get um, basic education, which we lack in our own communities. Like, you know, that's why I had to move away from home was to attend college, you know, in Colorado. But with that, you know, it doesn't mean, you know, forget who you are or forget where you come from, you know, bring it back, you know, make it possible to where, you know, everything that you've learned out in, you know, off your reservation, off your homelands, bring it home. That way, you know, we don't have to keep pushing that narrative that, you know, you're only going to be successful if you move off the res. Um, so personally, I want to, you know, go out and see the world and, educate others on two-spirit people and basically, you know, uh, preserve and celebrate my culture and who I am and teach it to the next generation so that our future is more, you know, is still preserved because at this rate, um, our elders keep telling us that, you know, in the next uh, couple years, our basically our whole culture and our, you know, language is going to die. And, you know, our language itself was a huge part of, um, the world war ii that happened um but yeah like i said uh going back to um the rugs and the pottery that's how i knew i was different you know mm. i wanted i wanted that design that was on a rug on a dress or like a, mm. you know a, a very um a fitting shirt <laughs> so i always would every time they would finish rug i would put it up against me and I would, you know, wrap it around myself because back then, I, believe it or not, I was a little smaller. <laughs> <laughs> um, so a whole rug can, and you know, rugs can vary sizes. They can be so small to anything as big as, you know, that wall. Mm. Um, and every, you know, like I said, when they would finish a rug or anything, um, they would tell me to, you know, go hang it up and I would go run to the restroom or the room real quick and just look at myself and I would want to see a garment like that on myself. And I got in trouble for it by my, um, by, I'm not going to say who they were, but you know, by a lot of, um, toxic masculinity, mm. um, would look down on that and say, you know, you're different, you're weird. And back then, you know, weird and different, basically being unique was seen as something that wasn't very celebrated and now that's all i love about myself you know mm. is being unique and you know celebrating my individuality um so yeah i'm sorry i i keep going no, you're good. <laughs> you're good. so um i'm just curious about what led you to you know realizing you were different right and saying I want to eventually identify as two spirit. What led to you eventually now? We've talked a lot about your brand and like, um, you know, just coming to fully lean into that, not just like say this is who I am, but then like acting on it and leaning into that. Mm -hmm. um, just considering some of the ways that, you know, the elders weren't accepting of it. And um, when in your life did you feel like you could fully um, take part in seeing what being two spirit meant to you? Um, whether that be on the reservation or, or you said you went to call, you went off to go to college. And yeah. I'm just curious what that experience was like, um, that eventually led you to, to where you are today and yeah. sharing um, and expressing yourself in the ways that you have and, and do. Yeah. So, um, when I moved off the reservation and I decided to pursue that, um, that way of thinking, you know, of, be successful, go to college. And I was the first generation, I was a first generation student, you know? Um, so I went to college in Colorado and that's where I really, um, got to experience, um, no, not really experience. Sorry. Let me backtrack. Um, that's where I really got to explore who I was because, you know, when I, on the reservation, I was very, uh, to myself, didn't want to be, you know, causing too much of a scene, didn't want to wear anything but black because I didn't want people asking questions, you know, why are you weird? Are you a girl? Are you a boy? Because at that time I was growing out my hair mm. and mm. with my voice, you know, people would always say, you know, are you a girl? Are you a boy? And back then, you know, that was the hugest, um, or the biggest, I guess you could say, um, the biggest um what is i can't think of it what is the opposite of compliment insult oh, yeah. yeah yeah there we go okay mm -hmm. sorry so yeah 
back then, you know, that was the biggest insult that you could give me because, you know, being misgendered mm. um, was just, oh, I did not like that at all. Yeah. So I made sure to kind of fly under the radar. But there was always that interest of makeup because, or not necessarily even makeup, just, you know, wanting to be creative. Um, mm. I would, uh, you know, help my grandpa with his pottery. I would help my grandmothers with, help my grandma and my great grandma with their rug designs. And um, basically that translated, you know, into paper where I was, you know, in school, like I said, I laid low. So I would just sketch to myself. And a lot of the times I found myself sketching uh, womenly figures mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, eyes, makeup on faces. And finally, you know, I got brave one day and this was like in junior high. I stole my grandma's um, eyeliner pencil <laughs> and um, I went to school and that's when I decided to whip it out in the um, in the restroom and I put it on my eyebrows because you know I didn't want eyeliner because you know I don't want to look like Marilyn Manson or anything <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to make myself feel a little ounce of confidence because I was lacking confidence badly and I still am today you know um, uh, I was, you know, overweight. I was pre-diabetic. I, you know, I was, I was just a weird kid. So overall, there was nothing. It was very hard to find something that I loved about myself. So then, you know, once I found the manipulation of makeup, I was like, mm. that's something I could do. So like I said, I translated what I did on paper into my face. And, you know, I already was sketching eyes and eyebrows on paper. So I was like, you know what, this is going to be so easy. And it was, but like I said, it was an eyeliner. So it was really dark and people had a lot of questions. <laughs> they were just like, why are your eyebrows so black? <laughs> so uh, no I, reason, right? I'm just like, mind your mind business. Your business right? Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> and my mom's uh, style of makeup was very um, early 2000s Chola. So like oh, I yeah. took her lip liner pencil and I used that as a dark brown and didn't look back from there. Um, so yeah, and I, that's as far as I took it in high school. I, that's as far as I wanted to take it because I was just scared of um, ultimately, you know, being bullied, bashed and harmed in that way because my grandparents always, you know, told me to love myself and be who I am, but do it um, on, you know, when you're in, when you're home, do it when you're safe, you know? Right. And so when I left for college, that's when my full potential unlocked. First of all, I went to I went to school here, um, not here here, but like I went to school in Utah for my first semester, and oh, that's wow. how I knew Condolences. it was not it for me. Oh wow, where'd you go? Yeah. Oh, um, I went to USU. Oh yeah. In, uh, oh wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, we all collective. Goodness. USU. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Side eye. Right. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So that itself, I was just like, yeah, I got to clock out. This is not for me. So um, props to you guys for sticking it out. <laughs> yeah. Um, for those I who don't not... know, USU is also like in a farmland area, just like mm -hmm. as a city girl. I went up there one time and I was like. It's very isolated. Yeah. Very mm -hmm. isolated. It's very different than even like Salt Lake, exactly. Provo, Orem. Like mm -hmm. it just feels very. Um, it's just, I mean, it's a traditionally historically a farming community. Yeah. No offense to anyone who went to USU or is up there. Yeah. Uh, not trying to offend anyone, but just right. um, even worse than what um, Utah is for like black and brown and indigenous people. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I knew I could not thrive there. I yeah. was just like, this is not for me. Right. Good um, for you. That's, and, a big, that's a big decision. Yeah. And it, it was a huge decision. So I moved home. Um, after one semester and I was like, it's not, I can't do it. And my grandparents encouraged me, you know, to just try somewhere else, you know, maybe Utah's not for you. So I did go to Colorado, at Fort Lewis. It is a, um, has a, which has a huge population of indigenous, uh, oh. students. Hmm. And that primarily is because, you know, uh, we are offered free tuition. Oh, wow. Um, oh, wow. If you know, yeah. And as long as you have some kind of proof, whether that comes in the form of a CIB, which is Certificate of Indian Blood, or um, I like to call it Certificate of Indigenous Blood because I don't like that word, Indian. Yeah. Um, yeah. You shouldn't. Yeah. yeah <laughs> it does not pertain to you. No, no, no. Exactly. So, yeah, just, you know, so that was a huge 
part of me going to that school because you know I come from I come from literally nothing um so I really did not want to put myself through loans I didn't want to you know stress my grandparents out in that way so I made sure I took the easiest route and I'm glad I did because I met some amazing people there and it's it's a liberal arts school so I that's when I first got into you know doing full face of makeup and everything mm -hmm. um at the time, this was in, I want to say 2015, 2014, uh, no, 2015, 2015 to 2016. There was no boys wearing makeup. I believe that's the year that James Charles finally hit mm. the scene. Mm. Yeah. And so like to see a, you know, a male wearing makeup at my campus, that's all I was known for was, oh, you're the guy that wears makeup. Hmm. And it was quickly, you know, celebrated. And you know, I, it was a quick identity for me. And I mm. loved it because um, no one was giving me weird stares. I mean, there was people, you know, uh, giving me weird stares, but like, not in the way that you would get that, you know, it's not the response I was, you know, expecting, which was incredibly mm. negative. Mm -hmm. Um it's a very split school. So like, you know, with the good comes the bad, but I, the good outweighed the bad. Mm. Um, and yeah, quickly adapted into it, um, made some friends just because, you know, they loved the way I did my makeup, made some friends because, you know, they wanted me to do their makeup. And uh, just PSA, just because we love doing makeup doesn't mean we want to do yours. Right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no. Unless you're paying me, girl. Like, yeah. <laughs> This is the gig. Course, um, yeah. So yeah, respect that, please. And um, so yeah, that's when I uh, fully unlocked my uh, potential with makeup. And that's when I caught um, so much attention from uh, because, you know, I started posting on Instagram mm -hmm. and social media. I got the attention of brands like, you know, Anastasia Beverly Hills, mm -hmm. Benefit. Um, I was put in newspapers. Okay, wow. And yeah, so it was just very you know something new that a lot of people weren't exposed to you know a guy or a you know a, a a male wearing makeup like it was just unheard of then james charles hit the scene it was more popularized and um but in our indigenous communities i was like one of the first mm. uh male indigenous makeup artists so i take pride in that i was yeah, just, um, you should. yeah so it's kind of like you know, a pat on yourself in the bag for being that trailblazer for the, you know, the future and the youth that is to come. And that is, I guess, when I turned, uh, came to terms with my uh, two-spirit identity was because, you know, um, it, it, it took my mom to tell me, you know, what it truly meant to be two-spirit um, because we were having a lot of um, losses in our family um, and it's, we still do, uh, from my grandma's sisters to, uh, you know, aunts and sisters being, uh, taken from us, which is a whole nother topic of, you know, missing and murdered indigenous mm -hmm. women. Um, she's, you know, she urged me to be careful, you know, because, you know, you are special. And I've always mm -hmm. known that, you know, she was like, you have two spirits inside of you. Cause you know, she was like, remember we're taught in our culture that you have a male and a female side and, you possess one or the other, but it is very rare that you can possess both. She's like, and you have both. Mm -hmm. And I want you to never be sorry for it. And, you know, because this at the time was when she was in a horrible car accident. Um, uh, um, she, uh, it was to the point where, you know, we thought we were going to lose her. Um, uh, so yeah, she gave me that whole speech before she mm. thought she was leaving and just basically told me, you know, to um, be proud of who I am and claim that identity and teach, yeah. you know, teach it to your siblings, teach it to your community and teach it to everyone and anyone who you can um, and just do it carefully, do mm. it in a respectful manner, do it in a traditional manner and always do it um, in a, uh, in a sacred manner. Um, so yeah, thank God, uh, thank the creator, you know, she, uh, she made, she made it through, um, it was a horrible accident. It was, um, it was a car accident where the truck rolled over multiple times. Mm. Um, to this day, she still, you know, has, um, brain injury to, um, um, 
but that's when I really claimed my identity and I was like, you know, this is something that I have to do and this is, and it just came naturally. And when she gave me that whole speech, it kind of unlocked so many, um, not unlocked. Yeah. It unlocked so much, you know, memories inside of me that were kind of suppressed from one spirit or the other, you know, saying, you know, that's not right. That's for women only, or, you know, vice versa. Mm. So, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Dang. It's it's beautiful. Amazing. Thank yeah. you for sharing. Yeah. Also, makeup is very good. When when you walked in, I was like, wow, it, it really love is. it. Oh I was God. like, wow, <laughs> you need to teach me a base routine because oh, um, thank you. Yeah, I love it. No, I was thinking that and um, lips look beautiful too. I just wanted to compliment you. <sighs> thank so. you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, have to always recognize, uh, recognize it when I see it. Um, sorry, Nate, did you want to go? Oh, no, you got it. You got it. Okay. Um, so kind of transitioning into your brand and like what made you want to start that. Um, just because you said you were getting recognized by these companies, mm -hmm. you know, you're out here posting on social media just about you, you know, doing makeup as an, and, you know, being one of the first of your kind as an indigenous person, um, a bit indigenous male doing makeup. That's just, I haven't met anyone before you um, uh -huh. who is doing that. And so... Uh, what was that like? Like, what was the kind of thoughts and what has it been like now as you are getting ready to, you know, fully launch and, and whatnot? Absolutely. So um, when I, you know, like I said, yeah, I was one of the first to come out on the scene as a male Indigenous makeup artist. Um, it was kind of unseen and unheard of. And the response, a lot of it, especially from the older generation, was very bad. You know, just basically saying, uh don't do that. You know, this isn't our ways. And after that whole two spirit um, talk with my mom, I kind of, you know, if that conversation didn't happen, I would have kind of, you know, took those comments to heart and maybe would have mm. stopped it completely. But I said, no, you know, this is who I am. This is what I'm here for. And if you don't like it, you can keep scrolling. Um, but for me personally, it is how I celebrate my two, two spirit identity. And Others love it. So um, when that all happened, um, like I said, it caught a lot of media attention and most of that was good. So I, I'm very grateful for that to be put in. I still have a lot of my um, newspapers because that day that mm. I was published, I went to the nearest 7-Eleven. I, I bought the whole stack. Oh, and I was yes. like, you're going to have to put out some more. As you should. <laughs> yeah, so I, I hoard that and my grandma uh, framed that. Um, she has that hanging up and I have a lot of them in my storage unit just, you know, for my kids or whoever might need one. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, um, I'm the same way. I have, I was featured on the BOE magazine and I'm like, you know what? I have like 20 copies still in my uh, storage. Too, so. <laughs> Don't feel bad. We all mm -hmm. do it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, uh, like I said, it was just insane, mind blowing, like how much uh, attention I was getting. And it was a little overwhelming, if I'm being honest. Um, mm. Like I said, these are huge multi billion dollar companies um, that are reaching out to you, you know, saying, hey, you know, do you want to be added to our peer list? Hey, um, how much do you charge for a post? And mm. back then, social media wasn't really seen as a job so right. to me that was very outlandish to be like how much do you charge for a post mm -hmm. and the yeah. very first company that offered that to me was believe it or not avon oh wow <laughs> the, yeah not okay. Avon. Yeah, I know. Okay. I like, oh okay um i've seen you in my grandma's collection <laughs> right no that's where yeah. i had some avon stuff when i was younger too mm -hmm. so yeah yeah so i was i was like oh not miss avon okay so <laughs> But work, yeah. They gave me my first, my first, uh, my first sponsored post, and they paid very handsomely. So, um, As they I was like, "This is something that you know could be. This is something here. I yeah. feel like I can run with this." Mm. So, when brands would reach out to me saying, "Hey, we'd love to give you, you know, some free makeup. Can you post with it and stuff like that?" At first, I would expect I accept with the quickness because that you know I want to expand my makeup collection, mm. and there's nothing wrong with accepting free PR. Let's just get that clear. Um, you know, PR is kind of seen as you know a no obligation exchange um, mm. for a lot of companies, but mm. for some companies, they're like, let's give you free makeup, but we expect X Y Z. Mm. You know, yeah, which isn't really PR at that point. That's that should be paid for. <laughs> no, absolutely. Um, so yeah, and. Um, 
to this day, um, Norvina, the president of Anastasia Beverly Hills, still follows me. Mm. And Anastasia Beverly Hills, the brand follows. Wait, that's her. Anyways. So, yeah, they still follow me and everything. They still send me occasion, the occasional package. But um, Benefit, Sigma, Artist Couture, um, just so many brands that are just, you know, I could never afford on my own to yeah. want to send me for free. Like, are you kidding? Yes, mm. please. Yeah. Um, I don't know where you at. Yeah. No, so. yeah. Sigma brushes. I'm like, Sigma. Okay. Yeah. I'm you like, know anything about makeup? You're like, wow. Yeah. Thirty dollars for a single brush. Come on. And they sent me their entire collection. Wow. This wow. Came in like a huge box, I'm and crying. I was so grateful. Yeah. <laughs> I, and I would post these on my stories all the time, but now it's just like the influx of you know PR you get um, when you get to that level. It's just like there's no reason to, to put it on your story. It's all overwhelming. Mm. Um. So I'll just make content with it and just tag them. <laughs> so that's what I do. Um, but like I said, all that attention happening in such a small amount of time was very overwhelming. I didn't know how to receive it, you know, and it got to my head really fast because I was just like, you know, what the heck do I do? Because at that time I was a full-time student in college. Mm. So like trying to juggle school homework with makeup content and all this stuff was just insane. So that's when I um, decided to go full throttle with it. I would take two five-hour energies a day, like oh for three gosh. days at a time to make content. Oh my yeah. That, at that point I was like doing like three to four looks in a amount of like 24 hours like okay, and wow. these aren't just like regular looks you know these are like, like special effects yeah. or just you know back then i was more into special effects and illusion makeup looks but you know i've toned down since then <laughs> um so yeah it, so oh sorry um but yeah that and to this day it still blows my mind because the fact that i have um you know, some president and ceos of these huge makeup companies in my phone and my contacts are it's just crazy. Right. You know? That's a big deal. Yeah. And um, including, you know, Marlena Stell from Makeup Geek. Love uh, her. Love I'm literally her. Iconic. obsessed with her. Iconic. Iconic. She Iconic. is from the beginning. <laughs> She's an OG. She She's an OG. Is. I still yeah. watch her videos. Uh, exactly. Oh, my God. I can't wait to see what she's releasing this uh, this fall. She's yes. coming out with something okay. else. If y'all know Makeup Geek, you deserve... That's uh, like OG YouTube. Exactly. Like original mm -hmm. makeup people on... Yeah. They're exactly. like the people who made... YouTube and content creation, they are what started that. From yeah. The, the ground. People up. are like, uh, Manny MUA, James Charles. I'm like, no, Marlena no. Stell. Come on. <laughs> exactly. ja um, what's her name? Jacqueline. Um, Jacqueline Hill. Yeah. Those people, they are the OGs. They are the OGs. They are okay. the OGs. And speaking of which, did you see that T on Marlena and uh, ja uh, what it was? I just said Jacqueline Hill. Jacqueline Hill. No, I did not see anything <gasps> about them. Oh. We'll have to talk after because yeah. I need to know it, this. Wait. The tea is hot. Hot. Okay. And the podcast that she just Marlena filmed just like a month ago, she spilled it all. Oh, it's insane. Okay, actually. I need to listen. <laughs> but um, yeah. So um, you know, Jen Gerard from Gerard Cosmetics, mm -hmm. um, they all supported me from the very beginning, and they, you know, they still, they still do. But mm, at the sound, uh, how would you say, um, none of the. Uh, this is going to sound really bad, but, you know, none of that really means anything. What really, really means the world to me right now is indigenous representation mm -hmm. and specifically in my niche, which is, you know, beauty and makeup. Um, we got, you know, very few indigenous brands that are out there right now. And I wanted to be a part of that, you know, those who are trailblazing the very first Um because if you didn't know, there are some indigenous brands now that you can find on like, you know, Macy's and JCPenney, which would have been, you know, impossible to see way back then. Uh, my good friend, CC Meadows, who is the owner and founder of Pro uh, Prados Beauty, she is, she just got her makeup into JCPenney last year. Mm. Yeah, which is a huge deal yeah. and a huge win for indigenous people everywhere. Um she personally is the one who has been, you know, my cheerleader from the very beginning and telling me, you know, you should get your makeup, uh, you know, get your makeup line started. Anyone can do it. And when I finally told her that I was going to be, you know, coming out with my own makeup brand, she uh, 
oh my gosh, her reaction was just everything to me. And mm-hmm. she was just like, yes, baby, you know, there's mm-hmm. enough room at this table, pull up a chair, we can mm-hmm. all eat. Um, you know, there's enough support and love to go around because it's really sad. Um, in our uh, indigenous communities, uh, we have a lot of, you know, people who talk down on you just because you know you're doing something you're doing something good and you're making something of yourself mm. they kind of get this i guess sense of jealousy to mm. where they think that you know if they tear you down that they're going to somehow get to your level which like, is not the case in mentality exactly the same with the black community too and it's just like there's enough you know support to go around for everyone Mm -hmm. we can all uplift each other we're already being you know suppressed by the dominant culture we shouldn't be you know attacking our own and pulling each other down Mm -hmm. it's just mind-blowing to me so i just want to shout out a few of my um sisters brands that you know have um started their own makeup brands and are doing it flawlessly Mm, so for the recommendations yeah 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 yeah. so i would love to do that oh Okay, for sure, for sure. So last question for you before we, you know, kind of wrap it up. Mm-hmm. What does the future hold? You, you, you're, you're kind of in the process of building your brand. You have this attention from, from major companies. You talked about wanting to, to help indigenous communities, yes. and especially um, indigenous communities that are also LGBT and two-spirit. So just, you know, what does the future hold for you? Like, what are some of your, like, big aspirations that you want to accomplish in, I don't know, say the next five, ten years? Yeah, exactly. Because um, you're going places. I really hope so. Um, you're going to say the Black Menaces knew it first. Yeah, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> After all the CEOs. Oh, I love stuff, that. Like, you know. Yeah. And, oh, my gosh, I'm just fangirling right now that I'm even here. <laughs> um, but like I said, yeah, um, a huge... A, uh, I was raised on that mentality of, you know... When you make it out there, you know, bring it back to your community mm. and, um, you know, preserve your, tra- your traditions and help your community. So um, that's a huge part of my life. I definitely am going to keep that with me. Um, so right now, like I said, a huge part of my, you know, five to 10 year plan right now is um with my makeup brand, you know, I want to implement a scholarship program for, you know, first generation mm. students that are indigenous, that were just like me, you know, that are broke and trying to find <laughs> yes. any resource to um, go to school, you know, um, and especially um, Afro-Indigenous uh, students, because that's a whole nother topic. Um, mm. Afro-Indigenous people are just invalidated it seems mm. like and it it's just not okay because i feel like it shouldn't you know indigenous identity isn't based off of your skin color or um you know the way you look or the way you talk um that's a lot of people right now i can already see the comments saying that you know he he's using his white man voice and <laughs> so yeah it's very like that um so mm. you know and it doesn't it doesn't necessarily mean you know it's a bad thing um, oh, sorry, I'm blinking right now. Um, so yeah, and like I said, I want to you know create that resource uh, youth center for the LGBTQIA mm-hmm. and Two Spirit um, community, and that right there is my huge one. Mm-hmm. I want to you know work directly with the Navajo Reservation and see what we can do to build that first um, that first queer facility, just because you know. There, there's there's nothing out there for us like that right. and there's barely even any grocery stores you know the fact that i have to travel or my grandparents have to travel two hours just to get to a walmart is insane mm. so um to have that youth center would be huge mm. other than that you know definitely like um college scholarship programs um and yeah, other than that, I just really want to see my people thrive and see Two Spirit Beauty um, uplift, you know, Indigenous voices and amplify those who feel like they don't have a voice mm-hmm. or they aren't being seen. Because, you know, I definitely see them and I acknowledge them. You know, any of my supporters that come up to me that want a picture or, um, you know, just to exchange some kind words, it's it, it's insane to me to f- feel to think that you know people put me on a pedestal like that because not even a couple weeks ago uh this these group of um i want to say they were like maybe 12 to 13 years old they came up to me and they were just very overly uh, over emotional 
And mm -hmm. I didn't know how to receive that, you know, because I was just like, I'm just, I'm just a guy who wears makeup, you know, mm -hmm. like I, I didn't think, you know, it meant so much deeper to other people. Um, so yeah, I definitely do appreciate all the love and support. And I try to give that back as much as I can. And um, whether that be, you know, uh, you know, following someone or, you know, give just being that ear or shoulder to cry mm -hmm. on. And like I said, um, my focus and right now is just, you know, trying to preserve my culture and celebrate two spirit people and, um, yeah, keep the teachings and traditions going strong. Because like I said, I definitely don't want to see my language and my culture and, you know, two spirit people in general, uh, disappear. Yeah. So, yeah. Love that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Well, thank well, you so much. Yeah, yeah thank absolutely. you. We will um, go to the recommendations tonight. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you want me to go first? I can go first. Okay. Go first this week. All right. So I got a couple of recommendations. Um, one, when you had briefly mentioned earlier, uh, Taro, when you were talking about um, missing and murdered indigenous women, mm -hmm. um, that's something that I've, I've heard a lot about, but I don't know a ton about. But I remember watching a movie and... Um, it was kind of about this and I, I like I didn't know what it was about I thought it was just another kind of like murder mystery yeah. movie <clears throat> so to speak but it's called Wind River have yes, you seen it? Yeah. yes. It's a I really, seen that really in, when I was in college yeah. oh my gosh I cried yeah uh, and the fact that the cinema only showed it for one week was a crime it was? because <laughs> I tried to get my grandparents come out to see it yeah yeah it's um it's a really good movie it's an amazing movie it's currently on Freebie which if you have Amazon Prime you can watch it um, but it's called Wind River and it stars, it's kind of a random combination, but Jeremy Renner and Elizabeth Olsen, which if you don't know them, you know, don't worry about it, but they're in a lot of Marvel movies. <laughs> um, but Jeremy Renner plays a detective uh, who goes out to uh, a Native American reservation in Wyoming and solves, uh, basically like solves the murder of, of an indigenous woman who's been missing and kind of in the process, like, um, uncovers like a few other murders um that have happened like women who've been missing as well and it just kind of highlights um the, some of the issues that indigenous communities face when it comes to to women going missing and nobody really doing anything about it um the the government doesn't really do much to solve those cases um and so it, it's an amazing movie i highly recommend it that's my my first recommendation in keeping with today's theme and then another recommendation on a, on a little bit of a lighter note I made a delicious s'more sandwich in the air fryer a couple I'm weeks ago. So dead. And uh yeah, I was I was I had a hankering for some fryer. chip cookies. What? I know, right? I was surprised, but I wanted <laughs> chip cookies. But I was like, nope, that's the last thing I need right now is some chip cookies. So I was like, but what can I have? Because I got a sweet tooth. I got a mean sweet tooth. So I went in the kitchen and I found some bread in the freezer or in the refrigerator or whatever. And so I was like, okay, I'm gonna just make like a, a peanut butter sandwich. So then I get the peanut butter out and I was like, ooh, we got cookie butter. So I put the cookie butter on the other side of the bread. And I was like, oh, we got marshmallows. So I took the marshmallows, put four marshmallows on it. Dead. And like, we got chocolate <laughs> chips. So then I sprinkled the chocolate chips Dead. on it. And I was like, you know what? This would be good if I put it in the fryer. So I threw it in the air fryer. I scraped some uh, coconut oil on the outside to mm -hmm. give it a nice little crisp. Crispy. So then I got a crispy s'more sandwich that thing pulled apart. It tasted just like a s'more, but it was probably like way better for you. It was high fiber bread, like whole wheat. It was high legitimate. fiber. So oh, I my Lanta. Yep. Yeah. Wait, That's is a... marijuana legal here? Um, no. Kind of, sort of. I think medically no. it is. No. Medically it is, but um, <laughs> recreationally, no. Ma marijuana? What is that? Right. I, I was just going to say, <laughs> like, what? that just sounds like the direct influence of I think my, my MJ. Name no. Because <laughs> <laughs> that is quite the concoction. Oh, my gosh. No. I would right. never. I, I said, <laughs> yeah, I thought he meant like he put graham crackers and marshmallows. No, in that's the, what no, I thought just, too. I was like, oh, that's kind of genius. No, actually, it, just, it, just, it kept getting better and better. So, yeah, it was cookie butter, s'more. Because like the cookie butter, I like the graham cracker flavor, you know. So that's my recommendation. <laughs> was the cookie butter from Trader Joe's at least? Um, it was whatever like the little brand in like the red container is the Biscoff brand. Oh, okay. So it was, like, oh, okay. OG cookie butter, you know. It was good. Yeah, that's like the yeah. I mm -hmm. will literally eat jars of cookie butter from Trader Joe's. Oh, man. It's so just good. Look, Nutella. Don't, don't bring Nutella mm, around me because exactly. the jar will be gone. That's breakfast. The jar of Nutella. That's breakfast no, in a jar. Not. Stop. <laughs> not in a long time. It That's how I got that. diabetes, actually. Oh, oh, oh. oh, not going to lie. I don't even know if you guys um, 
uh, I forgot to mention that I lost 130 pounds wow. in the last uh, three years, four years. Oh, wow. Amazing. Yeah, thank right. you so Class. much. Amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. Okay, fitness journey. Oh, right. Love that. Fitness journey, I should say. Just, just feeling a little journey. skinny. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And that was because, you know, I had to take a huge turn from my lifestyle. Like yeah. They told me, you know, I was over, I was diabetic, but like, you know, do you know what A1C is? Your your sugar level uh, being measured. Yes. Mine was off the charts. Oh, like it was wow. bad. And yeah, so like I, I had to quit soda. That was the big factor in it. Do you mm-hmm. guys know the the 44 ounce like big gulps mm-hmm. and stuff like yes. that? I can only relate to the same big gulps, but on our reservation, they're called 44 ounces. And they're like these huge ass cups that you probably see at Megaplex. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I would drink three to four of those a day. Oh a day. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was bad. It was an addiction. So sugar is a real addiction. Just saying. And that's yeah. honestly probably another like a whole other subject that like, we could probably have a whole other podcast mm-hmm. just talking about like how people on reservations are like in a basically a literal food desert like you hear about food mm-hmm. deserts in you know like um lower income areas like in big cities yeah but like on reservations there's so nothing like you worse. said two hours from a so walmart much worse like yeah let alone you know another place where you might be able to get some healthier food like i remember i used to live in arizona and we were like driving through a reservation once and i remember stopping at the gas station to get water and they're like oh we don't have water no here. water <laughs> like how do you, you like the, like they soda, would have a soda fountain, energy but drinks, no water. Yeah, and like the you know you went to K. I, we would stop at KFC. They had had no water in the in the drinking fountain or like anything like that. And, yeah. I was just like, and that's an ongoing uh, battle right now is our yeah. water rights. Which so that's another subject. Yeah. Uh, that could gosh. be a whole other podcast. Exactly. But, yeah. Sorry, I'll be back next month. Yeah. Ew. No. Exactly. <laughs> Part two. Um, Part two. <laughs> my recommendation for the week. Hmm. There's a lot of things I could recommend. Oh, wow, I'm not prepared. Okay, I guess my recommendation would be, since we're on the topic of makeup um, today, I just was inspired. Um, there's a lot of awesome makeup brands out there that are, you know, very expensive. However, um, there's an OG that I feel like has just been really popping off lately, um, Elf. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I feel like Elf has really like had a comeback. They had a little, seriously, had a little dip, but now they are back and better than ever. Like yeah. their Hydro Grip Primer, um, everything. That's what I'm wearing today. Yes, I the love that primer. And See, primer. I thought you were talking about the movie. Oh, <laughs> that just goes out the show. Not I like, quite. Elf. I it's like the that makeup movie. brand, but Elf Will makeup Ferrell. brand. <laughs> yeah, no. I recommend Elf okay, makeup, makeup brand. That gotcha. is my recommendation. They also I'm have a really good foundation that. Um, you can use as a dupe for like the Charlotte Tilbury, one of their really popular foundations. I forget the name. Um, the Elf Halo Glow. Yes. 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 I'm wearing that too. Oh, I'm see? just an Elf girl. You're the, yeah. You are representing my I recommendation. Live, so, I love Elf. Um, yeah, I recommend them. They also have a really nice brow um, putty or like. It's a very it's a very strong brow the brow wax. But yeah, brow I also wax. use that too. Um, That's what I'm wearing today yeah. too. Oh, look at this. I'm like full That's face crazy. Of elf right now. Yeah. So yeah, obviously <laughs> you are a representation of what that is. So I highly recommend Elf um, this week just because they're a really affordable way to look really good. Um, mm-hmm. Just because if you wear a lot of makeup, you run out of it fast. Um, I don't wear makeup as often because I um, work from home. But when I was wearing uh-huh. makeup every day, you um, you you start to run out of that, and yeah. it gets expensive very exactly. quickly. And Elf is a great. Alternative, um, and and they just have the staples that you need. Again, good foundation, good um, a primer, whatever. I, I splurge on other things, but if you those basics, you got to keep that under mm-hmm. a certain price because exactly. that's, those are the ones you use the most. And they have also really good uh, blushes that you know they don't. I really love Rare Beauties blushes. They don't dupe them, but they have like um, a the cream blush. Ones, yeah, the, the, those are also really really good. Yeah. Um, good pigmentation for the price so exactly that's it's really cheap the... to look this expensive exactly <laughs> yes yes so those um, are my recommendations for that. i love that oh my gosh because yeah they really did make a comeback yep um, mm-hmm. back then i would get laughed at for using their brow pencil yes and now, and now it's like all the girlies want it everybody wants oh. elf okay mm-hmm. they're selling out of elf now that's mm-hmm. crazy Come on, that's extremely trendsetters no, it's crazy <laughs> that they're selling out of elf i'm like we we need to reevaluate that's crazy yeah but. the fact that Urban Decay setting spray. This is how I'm, I'm probably revealing my age right now. But back when it came oh, out, yeah. I used it used to be like twenty five, maybe twenty eight dollars at yep. most. It is now like what sixty, oh, fifty eight dollars. Yep, it's wow. crazy. It's insane. Mm. It's insane. That's and why it's not I'm worth like, it. No, because there's mm-hmm. better. There are dupes. Everyone's um, just coming out with dupes at this point. It's like, yes. why are you wearing eight hundred dollars worth of a full face of makeup when you could be duped yep. that for just a hundred dollars? Yep. 
But also, um, you know, Anastasia, don't kick me off of your PR list. Yeah, no. <laughs> I no, love you. <laughs> but no, it's true. There are certain expensive brands, like the one setting spray that I think is worth the money is um Patrick Starr's um, setting spray. One something, whatever. The, it's like in a the can. The Until Dawn. That's yes, what I'm wearing the right now. Dawn. That is the, Patrick. No, it's the one in the yeah. same stuff. Okay. Oh, that is the one setting spray that is worth the money. Kit. It's like $30, mm-hmm. but it's worth it 30, because... 30, Four thirty, yeah, five? yeah. Y'all just listen to childhood it. movies. Your point. your makeup is <laughs> going. <start>. To... <laughs> no, your makeup I... will not move Mm-mm. with that. The on. amount of times that I blacked out and my woke up the next day and I still look like yeah, because <sighs> of that. Because of Patrick Star. So <laughs> thank, thank you, you. Okay. thank you for allowing me to black yes. out. Yes, <laughs> with my makeup on. It. Love it. Love it. Love it. So bad. Okay, so what are your recommendations for the week, Terrell? Let me grab my recommendations. Actually. Come on. Oh, not oh. grab them. Okay. Oh, right. Um, so and these you are. You need to look directly into the camera. We yes, need to get like yeah. this. The camera right here for this. So this, this is kind of. Um, these are my personal ones because you know, as a small uh, business owner, I kind of have to sell everything that I get. Right, right. I don't have the budget to have PR and stuff <laughs> like that. So Soon. this is going to be a very, <laughs> very love palette but um this here is from two spirit beauty i do recommend you know supporting indigenous people directly and in that way you can support them in numerous ways but the way you can support me directly is definitely buying from my makeup brand two spirit beauty and this here is my first ever makeup palette is called powwow season Ooh. um it is 100 percent vegan and cruelty free because okay, i wanted it to be a clean brand Love. let me find because... out to start wearing makeup <laughs> right oh my gosh that's the episode i can do your makeup <laughs> so yeah this here um designed everything by me like i said i don't wow. have money to you know pay a designer i don't have yeah so everything was made by me off an, an ipad I so that. i use my ipad to create this palette this beauty and this here is the color story it. um it is basically you know um everything that you can think of when you go to a powwow um mm. from the regalia the bright colors of the regalia mm. to the feather fans and oh, to wow. the drums the, that's where the the natural beige and black and white mm. colors come from this one i wanted to represent the eagle feathers and over here more like you know the drums and the gourds from our instruments okay, yeah. and these are just like from the the regalias yeah. and the costumes oh so beautiful and even the names even the names on them are inspired by um inspired by powwows so we got you know um inner just you know like inner tribal round dance grass dancer fancy dance Ooh. um and jingle dress is the one single um shimmer mm. the gold shimmer i use this as a highlight sometimes mm. it's oh, popping yeah. so that's yeah that's my um palette and then also we have the what the foe mink okay. <laughs> book. it's kind of like you know what the bleep yeah. but yeah um i wanted to play um have a play on words there because I, I i'm a sucker for dad jokes yes we love puns. it <laughs> very punny um so yeah that's what it says it says what the foam mink again everything designed by me like i said i don't got i don't got coin to <laughs> create mm-hmm. to have a designer um so in the name you know what the foam mink this is basically a lash book that has four styles of foam mink lashes that are you know you can wear up to 25 times oh, wow. but that's actually i was just at um an event this past weekend and i debunked that because i wore my lashes in the style jewels for the 27th time Ooh. and yeah so Man. i think i'm gonna try for a 28th but she's almost getting there <laughs> she, <yeah. laughs> she's, she's getting to that point she's getting to that point Wait, not gonna it. lie oh, and there are just other things that are to come that are so exciting these are only two of the four items that i launched when i first okay. started uh two weeks ago so yeah i'm so excited and other than that you know like i said um support doesn't have to always come you know in a monetary uh form it can also come in but it should yeah reparations Reparations. let's just (laughs) i love you guys that's funny (laughs) um but yeah other than that you know if you if you don't have the funds to support you don't even have to you know directly support my brand there are other amazing digital brands Mm. out there that you can support and buy on the shelves of like you know jc penny and macy's like um prados beauty asha beauty um cherish skin that's on florida those are my sisters by clan um and yeah just just so many amazing brands to support out there and like i said it doesn't even have to be makeup you can um donate to the mmiw fund you can also um just even you know sharing an article about 
um, our everyday battles. Like right now, the Navajo Nation uh, and our water and, you know, missing and murdered indigenous women and two-spirit people. Um, yeah, just, you know, supporting any way you can. But yeah, beautiful. that's my recommendation. Love, <laughs> a little, a little biased. No, beautiful. No, I love amazing. it. Love the plug. Um, I'm finna buy some makeup for no reason. Right. <laughs> for no reason. Um, but thank you so much for joining us today, Absolutely. Terrell. We really appreciate you coming in here, sharing your story, um, and educating us and our listeners on on your journey and Two Spirit People. It's a story that's not talked about enough, and mm -hmm. something that needs more attention and more education. Um, from all of us, but Nate, any, any closing words you want to say? Um, just uh, just the usual. Make sure that you follow us and support us on all of our platforms. So you can check us out at uh, Black Menaces on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter, and then The Black Menaces on YouTube. Um, we actually just passed our 2,000 subscriber mark on YouTube, so uh, keep helping us build that up. And then be sure to donate to us if you if you have the opportunity um, at the, the Black Menaces on Venmo, and then also the Black Menaces dot org slash donate you can sign up for a monthly or one-time donation um, if you are feeling so generous and then also you can purchase merch we got the og shirts and hoodies and good stuff like that stickers water bottles notebooks um, i think there's even a backpack on there if you're you know so excited to go back to school get your kids a <laughs> bm in this backpack yes um, i love yeah, that for to do that and uh y'all really thought of everything yeah we you tried. guys have like the budget of like uh the barbie movie right now no <laughs> <laughs> back we're, we're not at that level i hope we can one day <laughs> no no <laughs> we, you that. work hard but the barbie marketing team worked oh, harder oh, okay mm -hmm. so yeah, we pay. On I credit. swear, Chris Jenner's like on that team. Yeah, uh, on that marketing <laughs> team. Because no one so. works as hard as that woman. She's probably in the background. <laughs> that's cool. Yeah, yeah, that's all also, I got. Where, is that showing the town? I mean, I mean, where? Because I see people posting on uh, the Megaplex having a life size like Barbie case. Oh, and I want to see that. I don't know where that's you at, but I do know that probably, in the, probably the gateway. That's where the nearest Megaplex oh, is. Oh, yeah. The, yeah, the gateway. Yeah. It's like 10 okay. minutes from here, 20 minutes from here. Awesome. Yeah. Well, that's it for us. Thank you guys for joining us this week on the Black Menace Podcast. And we will catch you guys next week. Bye. Peace.